and, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but when I was considering the, the, the list of names that the government might put up for interview this morning, yours was not necessarily at the top of the list. And you will understand why. It wasn't that long ago that you were being pretty openly critical about Boris Johnson and perhaps his longevity. I'm, I'm just wondering, does your appearance this morning mean that you're back to being BFFs? No, look, it's, it's very clear. I obviously have had some differences with the government over the last couple of years about how it's handled the, the COVID pandemic. I would have preferred we'd uh, got the economy firing on all cylinders uh, a little bit earlier than the government. Um, and obviously, before Christmas, uh, I led a bit of a rebellion um, uh, about the, the restrictions the government put in place. But actually, I think that was the right thing to do. I think it meant the government held its nerve uh, over Christmas uh, and we've seen that the figures have remained the same we've got the economy firing on all cylinders and thank goodness we did because it was only a few hours between getting all of those restrictions lifted uh, and then we saw the appalling Russian invasion of Ukraine and we've gone from one crisis straight into another which provides obviously a very difficult and challenging backdrop for the Chancellor um, as he sets out his spring statement uh, later today. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly does. But at the same time, you also did say regarding the kind of the ongoing row about Partygate and who do you what and when in and around Downing Street, you did say that you wanted to wait for the conclusion of the Metropolitan Police's inquiry. We are not at that point. So again, I will say it, it does rather feel that what is happening in Ukraine has perhaps to some extent shaped your view of the Prime Minister. No, I've, I've been very clear on, on the, the issues around uh, how Downing Street dealt with uh, the, the so-called party gate saga. I've said I'm prepared to wait. The Prime Minister wants us to judge him on the facts. I've said I'll wait for the conclusion of the Metropolitan Police criminal investigation, which is ongoing, and the full Sue Gray report when she completes that and that's published. But that's a judgment, I think, for another day. We've obviously got this important uh, Ukraine situation uh, ongoing, and the government's obviously doing a good job on leading opinion on that and then we've got the very important spring statement today so Partygate hasn't gone away but it's not for today it's for a day in the future when the Met's finished its inquiry and the Sue Gray report is published. Indeed. Uh, well, let's get straight on to the economics of it all. And as you were just hearing, we have had those latest inflation figures. CPI up from 55 to 6.2%. Certainly feels like we may well be on track for 8% for as predicted in April. Do you think it's an inevitability that we're going to hit double figures at some point this year? Well, look, I think what is certain is that actually the economic picture is very uncertain because of what's happening uh, in Europe uh, uh, with the Ukrainian situation. Uh, and I think anyone who, th who, kn who thinks now they can forecast what's going on in the autumn, uh, I think is likely to be wrong. I think what it does illustrate is the Chancellor's got competing pressures today. He understands the situation facing uh, consumers uh, and businesses. Uh, but he also needs to make sure that that inflation outlook, the fact that interest rate pressures are going upwards, uh, debt interest is higher, and he also needs to build in some resilience to deal with whatever the, the future may throw at us. So those challenges, I think, are all competing um, and provide a difficult balancing act for today. And I think that's the judgment that I'm confident that he'll get right when he sets out his statement at lunchtime. Of course, we have heard from the Chancellor, you know, facing quite a lot of pressure over the, 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 the pending increase to national insurance, that, that it will go ahead, that there is mm -hmm. a necessity to it. I mean, you would concede, I'm sure, that the Cabinet is not united on this particular issue, let alone the party. I mean, is there perhaps some wiggle room for Rishi Sunak in perhaps tinkering with the threshold in terms of, North, uh, in terms of national insurance? Well, look, I can't comment on the, on the specifics of what's going to be announced today, but I think on the national insurance rise, it's very clear. Uh, we've said we're going to put an extra £12 billion into, first of all, into the health service to deal with the backlogs that have arisen because of the pandemic, and then a long-term funding settlement for social care. If you're going to say you're against the national insurance rise taking place either this year or in the future, you've got to say whether you're prepared to not put that money into the health service or social care or come up with some other way to pay for it. People that say they want to put off these rises uh, but still want to go ahead with the tax rises and uh, the spending increases are just not being serious. So Labour, sure, for sure, example, it's not as if the Chancellor the doesn't have money to play around with. But still want to spend happen. the it's, money. It's not as if the Chancellor doesn't have money to play around with. I mean, estimates vary, but we are talking about tens of billions of extra revenue sitting in the Exchequer at the moment. 
Well, I think, I think one of the problems is everyone's looking at the, the upside points, uh, and there may well be, I haven't seen the forecast, there may well be extra revenue, but I think people are forgetting there are also extra costs. So there are cost pressures on public services, and also we've obviously, obviously had to borrow a very significant amount of money, rightly mm -hmm. in my opinion, to deal with the uh, economic impact of the pandemic, but that means the economy is vulnerable to rises in interest rates, and inflation, and we saw yesterday very significant debt interest payments. Mm -hmm. The Chancellor has to be mindful of that uh, when he's making decisions. And, you know, we were able to help consumers uh, with an announcement in February of £9 billion to deal with uh, a big chunk of the rise in energy costs. That was only possible because the Chancellor had some resilience built into the system and I think given the uncertain outlook for the rest of the year I want to make sure that there's a certain amount of resilience built in so that we can deal with whatever shocks are thrown at us in the future and the government can respond to help consumers and businesses cope with what the world throws at them. Sure, but a very specific question from your perspective is this a point where the Chancellor could rely on, <clears> on extra borrowing or, or should we be using these surpluses and there are surpluses to start paying down some of the debt? Well, I don't think, I think pretending that you can continue borrowing at the level that we have been over the, the pandemic, I think just isn't serious. We, we borrowed for a one-off shock, uh, which was the biggest economic shock for 300 years. That was the right thing to do to protect millions of jobs and thousands of businesses. That was successful. We've, if you look at the recovery from the pandemic, we've got some of the best numbers uh, across the world. We've got a record number of people on payrolls. We've got very low unemployment. You know, businesses have started recovering, but we've got to make sure that we continue that sensible economic management uh, and we build some resilience into the system to deal with whatever the world throws at us. So I think the Chancellor, I'm sure, will look to help consumers yeah. and businesses where he can uh, and is on people's sides. But I think he's also got to be mindful of the very, very uncertain position coming in the future. And I think the public would expect him to build that resilience and that security into the public finances so that he can look at dealing with whatever problems arise in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the one of the things that the world, in your words, is throwing at us at the moment is, of course, the the the, the violence that we are seeing in and around Ukraine. Is, is there not a really strong mm -hmm. argument for a significant increase in defence spending at the moment, particularly given the amount of uh, munitions, materiel that we are providing to the Ukrainians at the moment? Uh, well, there is, and of course we had had that very significant increase in defence spending uh, in the budget. That was the largest uh, increase announced in defence spending over the next few years uh, for some time. And, and of course the, the government's integrated review had Russia as the top security threat. So sure, that, 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 that did, that did rather precede the violence in Ukraine though. Yes, it did, but it, it recognised Russia as a threat. It was a very significant increase in defence spending, and we remain the second largest spender in NATO. What's been very welcome, of course, is that what's happened in Europe has meant that those European nations who haven't been spending the 2% of GDP, which we more than exceed, have also now decided to increase their, increase their defence spending. And what's important is that NATO as a whole has the resources and the funds to deal with the mm -hmm. threats we face. So I welcome those increases, but we made a very big commitment to defence spending uh, in the budget just a few months ago. Um, can we talk about um, COVID uh, briefly, Mr Harper? It's two years now. Since, sure. since the first lockdown. So many of us, of course, have been affected individually, personally. We will all know people who have been ill. Mm -hmm. Many of us will know people who have died. Indeed, we have a, a rather brave 13-year-old girl who'll be on the programme just a little bit later this morning telling us about her, her father who passed away. What, what lessons have you taken away from the past two years? Well, I think, first of all, uh, it's been a very difficult year for many people and, and a huge number of people have had very, very difficult personal circumstances to deal with and I'm very mindful of that. Uh, I'm also very conscious that, uh, you know, our uh, scientists and our health services responded incredibly well so that we could develop the vaccines, get them rolled out and we're now in a position where with vaccines and the antivirals that we've got, we're in a position where we've been able to enable people to get back to normal uh, living with the virus, it's going to be with us forever, it's not going away and we've had to deal with that and I think the country, uh, individual people and some of our systems have responded very well. There will be lessons to learn which is why I'm pleased that the 
public inquiry has been set up. The chair of that inquiry is consulting on the, the terms of reference. They're very broad. They'll look at you know, the government's decision making, the evidence, how it balanced things and weighed things up. And I look forward to that uh, inquiry. I'll be delighted to give evidence to it in due course. And it'll set out, you know, when it reports, uh, the lessons to be learned for the future. Um, we do have to let you go, Mr Harper. Before you do, um, you, you'll have noted that the, the Royals currently touring the, the Caribbean at the moment. They've been met by protests in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Plenty of anger, plenty of speculation that Jamaica may well be uh, preparing moves to make itself a republic. I, I'm wondering, given that, is now the time for the Royal Family to apologise for its role in benefiting from slavery? No, look, I, I think the Royal Family uh, leads uh, or sets out these things uh, very well when it goes on its tours. I don't think it's wise for the royal family to get involved in, in politics. That's a matter for the government. Uh, and decisions about the future of uh, Jamaica's constitutional status are a matter for the people of Jamaica uh, and the government of that country. It's a, a democratic country, uh, and that's right and proper. I think it's much better if the royal family stays out of politics uh, and leaves that to the politicians, and they maintain that constitutional status where they can unite the country. And I think from Her Majesty the Queen Down was in her Jubilee year. I think the Royal Family uh, do that fantastically well. Mr Harper, great to have you on the programme this morning. Thanks for being with us.